This video is about semi-log plots. This is AP Precalculus Topic 2.15. If you appreciate this content, please give it a like. In a semi-log plot, one of the axes is logarithmically scaled. In AP Precalculus, it will always be the y-axis that is logarithmically scaled. When a semi-log plot where the y-axis is logarithmically scaled, exponential functions will appear linear. Let me demonstrate the advantage of semi-log plots by starting with two graphs that are not semi-log plots. Which one of these two graphs is the graph of an exponential function? Think about it. Haha! -ha, trick question! The answer is both of these graphs are actually graphs of exponential functions. Obviously the graph on the right is exponential. You can see it shooting up into the sky as it goes to the right. But even though the graph on the left looks linear, uh, it is actually exponential as well. It's just that the graph is shifted 30 units to the right. So that in the window shown, all we are seeing is the tail of the exponential function, the part near the asymptote that looks flat. However, if we graph that same part of the curve on a semi-log plot, we can tell that the values are actually increasing. Always remember that exponential functions will appear linear on a semi-log plot. Both of these graphs show the population of English Americans in the United States from 1620 to 1820, where t equals 0 represents the year 1620. The graph on the left shows the population using a normal scale on the vertical axis. The values on the y-axis are evenly spaced, going up by 1 million each time. The graph on the right is a semi-log plot where the vertical axis has been logarithmically scaled. This means that the values on the y-axis are changing multiplicatively. In this case, as we move from one value to the next, we are multiplying by 10 each time. Notice that on the normally scaled graph, the first five values appear constant. That's because eventually the values get all the way up to 7 million. In order to fit a value that large on the graph, we have to zoom out so far that smaller values appear almost the same. On the semi-log plot, even though the largest values still fit on the graph, we can actually see the changes among those first few values. Example 1. Use the features of the semi-log plot above to justify why an exponential model is appropriate. I'm going to disagree with the premise of the question a little bit. If a semi-log plot appears linear, an exponential model is appropriate. However, only this part of the graph appears linear on the semi-log plot. So, an exponential model is appropriate starting here. Remember that t equals 0 represents the year 1620. So, the number 40 here is really 1620 plus 40. This is the year 1660. We can say that an exponential model is appropriate from 1660 to 1820 because the semi-log plot is roughly linear. Example 2. After Mr. Passwater tells another one of his hilarious math jokes, it begins to spread around the school. The number of people P that have heard the joke after T minutes is graphed on the semi-log plot above, where the vertical axis has been logarithmically scaled. Which of the following functions could be a model for P? Notice that the semi-log plot appears linear. That means the actual function p must be exponential. We can immediately throw out options a and c because these are not exponential functions. On a semi-log plot where the numbers on the y-axis are multiples of 10, it works like this. We start counting from 1, and first it goes 1, 2, 3, 4, all the way up to 10. But once you get to 10, 
then you start counting by tens. So it goes 10, 20, 30, 40, all the way up to 100. As you pass 100, you start counting by hundreds, and so on. That means that the y-intercept is the point 0, 2. Let's use this to choose between the remaining two options. For option B, P at 0 would equal 2 plus 2 to the 0 power. 2 to the 0 power is 1. So that means P at 0 is 2 plus 1, which is 3. That is not 2. So B is not the answer. On the other hand, for option D, if we do P at 0, that would be 2 times 2 to the 0 power. Again, 2 to the 0 power is 1. So that means P at 0 is 2 times 1, which is 2. And that is what we wanted. So the answer is D. Here's an important note about semi-log plots. When we logarithmically scale uh, the vertical axis of a semi-log plot, we are not actually changing the y values of the data. To logarithmically scale the vertical axis, it means that equally spaced values on the y-axis are proportional, whereas equally spaced values on the x-axis are linear. Uh, by the way, that's why we call it semi-log plots because we are only logarithmically scaling the vertical axis, not the horizontal axis. Example 3. The table above gives selected values for the function f. Which of the following graphs could represent these data in a semi-log plot where the vertical axis is logarithmically scaled? For a semi-log plot, equally spaced values on the vertical axis will change multiplicatively. For option A, the values are changing additively. We are increasing by 0.5 each time. So this is not a semi-log plot, and the answer cannot be A. For option B, we only have two values labeled on the vertical axis. That's not enough to tell whether these values are changing additively or multiplicatively or neither. So uh, this is not going to work. For option C, equally spaced values on the vertical axis are changing additively. So C cannot be the answer. It has to be multiplicative for a semi-log plot. For option D, equally spaced values on the vertical axis are changing multiplicatively. As we go from number to number, we are multiplying by 10 each time while on the horizontal axis, the values are spaced additively, as usual. So this is a semi-log plot. Of the four, this is the only semi-log plot, so we know the answer is going to be D. But let's look at a couple of the values and see how they match up to what we see. So for example, uh, this first point right here is the point uh, one comma, and remember how we count. Once we pass 10, we are counting by tens. So this line right here is 10, but then it goes 20, 30, 40. So this dot is at 1, 40. So when we scroll up and look at the chart, and there it is, 1, 40. The next dot should be at 2, 60. Let's look for that one. So here's 2, and it goes 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60. So this does make sense. Let's look at one more. Let's look at this point right here. This is 5 comma, and by, as we pass 100, we are to count by hundreds. So this is 100, 200. So this point should be something close to 5 comma 200. Let's look at the chart. So 5 comma 203. So this makes sense. Example 4. Plot the following points on the same coordinate plane above. 0, 200. So as we pass 100, we count by hundreds. So this is 100, 
the next line will be 200. So this is the point 0, 200 right here, and let's just label it with an A. Now point B, 1, 25. So um, these are the numbers 1 through 10. As we pass 10, we need to start counting by tens. So this is 10, 20, 30. So 25 is going to be right here in the middle. So this is 1, 25. Let's label this with a B. 2, 7. So uh, these are the numbers 1 through 10, sort of like normal. So this will be um, 2, comma, but just remember we're starting with 1. So this is 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Okay, so that is C. Point D is at 3.2 on the horizontal. 3.2 is right here. On the vertical, it's at 800. So as we pass 100, we begin to count by hundreds. So this is 100, 200, 300, 400, 500, 600, 700, 800. So this is point D. On the horizontal, 4.6 is right here because it goes 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.6. And then we have 1.5, and uh, this baseline is 1. The next line would be 2. So 1.5 would be right here. So this is point E. We have seen that an exponential function looks linear on a semi-log plot. Specifically, on a semi-log plot, the exponential function y equals a times b to the x power looks like the linear function y equals mx plus b. In the form y equals mx plus b, remember that the m is the slope of the line and the b is the y-intercept. I'm going to stop writing m and b though because I don't want you to get confused between this b and this b which are two completely different things. So I'm going to erase this now. However, just remember that the slope of an exponential line on a semi-log plot is the log of b and the y-intercept is the log of a. This base n corresponds to the base used for scaling of the vertical axis. In other words, the n is the multiplicative change between equally spaced values on the vertical axis. Example 5. The semi-log plot above corresponds to the data table for example 3. Part A. Write an equation for the linear model for the semi-log plot of the form y equals log base n of b times x plus log base n of a. In this case, n is equal to 10. So log base n of b becomes log base 10 of b, or simply log b. And log base n of a can be simply written as log a. I find that the easiest way to write this semi-log linear model is to begin by writing the good old-fashioned exponential model. So I'm going to do part B first, and then use that to actually do part A. We can use this first input-output pair to write an equation. If I plug in 1 for x, I should get 40 for y. So this model becomes a times b to the 1 power is equal to 40. We can write another equation using the second input-output pair. If we plug in 2 for x, we should get 60 for y. So the model becomes a times b to the second power is equal to 60. Back on this first equation, b to the 1 power is just b. So if I divide both sides by b, we find that a is equal to 40 over b. If we substitute this expression for a in right here, we get 40 over b times b squared is equal to 60. 
This b in the denominator will cancel out one of the b's from the b squared. We are left with 40b is equal to 60. Dividing both sides by 40, we get b is equal to 60 over 40. Uh, dividing by 10, this is going to reduce down to 6 over 4, which further reduces to 3 over 2. So I'll just squeeze that in right here. So b is equal to 3 over 2. At the beginning, we found that a is equal to 40 over b. So I've just copied that here. But now we know that b is 3 over 2. When you divide by a fraction, you multiply by the reciprocal. So we will have a is equal to 40 times 2 over 3. Um, this is 40 times 2, which is 80, divided by 3. So a is equal to 80 over 3. Now that we have the values of a and b, we can write the exponential function. y is equal to 80 over 3 times 3 over 2 to the x power. That's y equals a times b to the x power. We can also use the values of a and b to write the semi-log linear model. Remember, it's going to be y equals log b, so that's log 3 over 2 times x plus log a. So plus log 80 over 3. So that's it. This is the semi-log linear model. Number 6. Which of the following tables provides evidence that f is an exponential function if y equals f of x. Notice that for options a and b, the y values are scaled normally. It's just a y. On the other hand, options c and d are scaled logarithmically. We have the natural log of y as the output. These would be perfect for semi-log plots. A normal plot will be exponential if the output values vary multiplicatively for equally spaced input values. However, these output values vary additively, so a is not an exponential function. For option b, the input values are equally spaced, but again the output values do not vary multiplicatively. So option b is not exponential either. On a semi-log plot, Output values will vary additively for exponential functions because on a semi-log plot, exponential functions appear linear. For option C, the input values are equally spaced, while the output values vary multiplicatively. But this is a semi-log plot, so if this is to be exponential, the output values should vary additively, not multiplicatively. So C is not exponential. So the answer must be D, but let's see why. Option D is a semi-log plot, and the output values do vary additively for equally spaced input values. So option D is exponential. Number seven, the function f is given by f of x equals a times c to the x power, where a is always greater than zero, and c is greater than 1. Which of the following is true about the values of m and b in the equation natural log of f of x is equal to mx plus b? Earlier in the video, we learned that the log of the base is the slope of the semi-log linear model. So this is like the m. And we learned that the y-intercept is the log of the a value in the front. This is what they're calling the b value. Notice that uh, in the problem we're working on now, they replace this b with a c, so we wouldn't get it confused with the y-intercept. So the slope m will be 
the log of the base of the exponential function. So in this case, m will equal the log of c. And the y-intercept b will equal the log of the a value, so natural log a. Quick side lesson. We have memorized that this is what the parent function y equals natural log x looks like. Also memorize that this x-intercept is at 1. The question is, when will natural log x be positive and when will natural log x be negative? Looking at the graph, we can see that natural log x is positive when x is greater than 1. We can see that natural log x is negative when x is between 0 and 1. For example, natural log 3 is positive because 3 is greater than 1. On the other hand, natural log 1 third will be negative because 1 third is between 0 and 1. Uh, I can sort of prove that to you in two ways. Uh, one way is let's put this in a calculator. If we type natural log of one third into the calculator, we are going to get a negative number. If we just type in natural log three, that's going to be a positive number. Here's another way to see why natural log of one third is negative. Natural log one third is the same thing as natural log of three to the negative one power. Using our properties of logarithms, we can take this exponent and put it to the front. So we would get negative natural log of three. So that's why uh, natural log of one third is a negative number. Back to the problem. They told us that A is positive. Does that mean that natural log A will always be positive? Of course, a had to be positive because you can't take the natural log of a negative number. However, natural log a could be anything. We just saw that if a is something uh, bigger than one, you know, like, uh, like natural log two, then that's going to be positive. But if a is something positive, but between zero and one, uh, like the natural log of two thirds, then that's going to be negative. So natural log A can be negative or positive. It can be any number. So that means B can be any number. On the other hand, we are told that C has to be bigger than one. And if C is greater than one, that means natural log C has to be positive, which means M is positive. Let's compare this information with the answer choices. Option A says m is greater than zero because natural log c is greater than zero. Well, that's what we just said. m is equal to natural log c, which is greater than zero. Option A also says that b can be any real number because natural log a can be any real number. Um, that's also what we decided. Natural log a can be any real number so therefore, B can be any real number. So the answer is A. Looking at the other answer choices, option B is wrong because it says that B has to be greater than zero. It doesn't, it can be anything. Option C is wrong because it says M can be any number. It can't, M has to be greater than zero. And for the same reason, option D is also wrong. Number eight, in a semi-log plot, which of the following pairs of functions appear as parallel lines? On a semi-log plot, lines are actually exponential functions. So we are looking for a pair of exponential functions. So the only pair of exponential functions are in option C. When you are talking about an exponential function, the variable is in the exponent. Also, parallel lines have the same slope. Earlier in the video, we learned that the slope of a semi-log line is the log of the b value. 
In option C, we see that the B value for both functions is two. So both lines would have a slope of log two. Number nine, the table gives ordered pairs of the form x comma natural log y. So this is a semi-log plot. For the function y equals f of x, which of the following statements about f is supported by the data in the table? We notice that for equally spaced input values, the output values vary additively. And we know that on a semi-log plot, if the output values vary additively, the function is exponential. So I'm going to look for the option that says some version of that. Options A and B are out because they say that F is logarithmic or F is linear when we know that F is exponential. The answer is C, which says the function F is exponential because the values of X and the values of natural log Y both form arithmetic sequences. When they say that uh, the values form arithmetic sequences, that's another way of saying that the values change additively. D is not the answer because it, it doesn't matter that the uh, output values increase faster than the input values. That just has nothing to do with it. Number 10, uh, we notice that we have log base three of f of x on the output values. So this is another semi-log plot. Consider the function f. The table gives values of log base three of f for selected values of x. Which of the following is a graph of y equals f of x? Notice that for equally spaced input values, the output values vary additively. That means we are talking about a semi-log plot that is linear. That means that f of x is an exponential function. So an exponential function will look like an exponential function on a normal graph. However, it will look linear on a semi-log graph. So look at option A. Is this a normal graph or a semi-log graph? This is a normal graph because equally spaced values on the vertical axis vary additively, one, two, three, four. On a normal graph, an exponential function would appear exponential. So A is not the answer. Is graph B a normal graph or a semi-log graph? This is another normal graph with the values on the vertical axis changing additively. So an exponential function would appear exponential. But this graph is clearly logarithmic, not exponential, which looks like something more like this. So B is not the answer. Option C is a normal graph with the numbers on the vertical axis changing additively. And on a normal graph, an exponential function should look exponential, which it does. So C might be the answer. Uh, but looking at option D, this is also a normal graph. Uh, if you look carefully, from 18 to 27, that's an increase of 9. And then from 27 to 36, that's another plus 9. So these values are also changing additively. So this is a normal graph and it also looks exponential. So how do I know if the answer is C or D? Let's use this input output pair to tell which option is correct. The log base three of f of x should equal three at x equals one. For option C, at x equals one, f of x is three. So we would have the log base three of three. And that of course equals one, not three. So it's looking like the answer must be D, but let's follow through and check it out. At x equals one, f of x is 27. So we would have the log base 3 of 27. And that 
is equal to 3, just like we wanted. So the answer is D. Number 11. The number of thousands of people that have visited a new website is recorded every 10 days for 60 days. These data are used to produce a semi-log plot as shown. The function n gives the number of thousands of people that have visited the website for day t. Which of the following could define n of t? Since we have a semi-log plot that appears linear, that means n of t must be exponential. So that eliminates option A and option B. This point right here is the point 10, 5. Remember, the bottom line is 1, and then it goes 2, 3, 4, 5. Let's use this point to decide whether C or D is correct. If we plug in the input value of 10 for t, we should get an output value of 5. Option C becomes 2.5 times 2 to the 10 over 10. That is 2.5 times 2, which is 5. So it's looking like C might be the answer. But let's look at option D before we circle it. If we plug in 10 right here, then option D becomes 3 plus 2 to the 10 over 10 power. That's 3 plus 2, which is also 5. So that didn't really help. Let's try going on to the next point. Let's try the point 20 comma 10. For an input value of 20, we should get an output value of 10. So if we plug in 20 for option C, we get 2.5 times 2 to the 20 over 10 power. That's 2.5 times 2 to the second power. That's 2.5 times 4. So that is 10. So it's looking like C might be the answer. We were fooled before, so let's try option D. If we plug in the 20, D becomes 3 plus 2 to the 20 over 10 power. That's 3 plus 2 squared. That's 3 plus 4, which is 7, not 10. So the answer is C. Hey guys, don't forget to like and subscribe, but also if you found this video helpful, there's a lot more where that came from. You can click the upper link which will take you to the whole unit playlist, or you can click the lower link, which will take you to the next video in the playlist. See you there.